My name's Paul Gardner. I've been involved with B'nai B'rith ever since youth group days, 1957. Joined uh, B'nai B'rith in 1970 and we've been continuous members ever since. Oh, my name's Helen Gardner uh, and I joined B'nai, B'nai B'rith Youth in about 1958, I think. That's where I, not where I met Paul, but where we got together. Uh, and so uh, B'nai B'rith is responsible for our 50 years of marriage. Well, I first met Helen at university. She was uh, on a chemistry laboratory bench just a few metres away from me because we were organised alphabetically and her maiden name was Feld. I was, and my name still is, Gardner. <laughs> uh, so we, we saw each other and I took one look at her and I knew instantly that this was a girl that I could sell a B'nai Youth raffle ticket to. Um, but that was it, really. Uh, I didn't take any greater interest. Uh, she took, I think, a greater interest mm. in me. Um, but I know we, a good thing when I see it. Uh, we met again at B'nai Youth uh, a couple of years later, and we worked together on the committee, and, well, cool. the rest is history. You know, one thing leads to another. You work together with somebody, mm. you get to know them, and it became friendship, engagement, marriage, children, golden wedding anniversary. What B'nai B'rith has done for me as, a, as an individual has been a very important part of my life. Um, I joined when I was a young adult. I was a first year university student. And within a year I was on the committee of B'nai B'rith Youth. And that gave me lots of opportunities to learn numerous uh, skills involved in helping to run an organisation, writing newsletters, um, being on the committee and uh, writing minutes of, uh, of committee meetings. And later on in my professional life, all of that uh, experience was extremely useful in what I did later on as an academic. Initially, B'nai B'rith was like a family for me. Uh, it filled a sort of hole in my life, really. I didn't have very much family. And I found, and I liked its philosophy. I liked the, it wasn't just a social group. It had um, things to do for other people. So, and I, I really re uh, related to that. I thought that was great. For me, I also uh, found something of importance in B'nai B'rith. I grew up in what might be called a traditional Jewish home, not a strictly observant one. But through B'nai B'rith, I learned about tolerance and about accepting a wide range of religious practice and not uh, taking a very narrow view of what it meant to be Jewish. And that has really stayed with me all of my life. In those days, I should say, uh, women didn't become presidents. When Paul was president, I was vice president. So that the men became president and the women were, were vice presidents in charge of catering. <laughs> they, they are, times have changed. Times have changed, yes. yes, yes. <laughs> but I did learn. Uh, well, when, I, when we joined B'nai B'rith as the senior lodge, I, at that stage there were still men's lodges and women's chapters. And so I joined the women's chapter. And, and I, know, I saw it happen to me and I saw it happen to other people, the way that people could develop, women could develop. People, women would come in and you would ask them to give a report of a meeting and they would, with their knees knocking and their hands shaking, they could hardly put two words together. But if you gave them the opportunity to continue to do that, then they could improve and they could learn and they could gain confidence in themselves. Um, I don't think I needed quite that level of confidence gaining, but nevertheless I became president of um, uh, First Shalom and then later Steve Klein and I were involved in setting up Unit Mitzvah and I was, we were co-presidents of that when it began. And, and I think I saw that happening, I know it happened to me as well, that B'nai B'rith enabled a person to develop skills, as Paul said, that it, when it, that it was instrumental in helping to develop his skills. It didn't help so much perhaps in my work, but it really was a life, a lifelong development that it gave you the opportunity to take responsibility and to actually do things. The Anti-Defamation Commission has been a very important part of my life in B'nai B'rith. It all began, not of my own initiative, it all began when uh, President Kurt Lippmann, the district president in uh, 1982, asked me would I chair the Anti-Defamation Commission. I hadn't thought about doing that. I had an interest in um, 
combating racism and uh, supporting Israel, but I hadn't been involved with any organisation in, in running such a thing. And so I took on the position of uh, Anti-Defamation Commission Chair in 1982, and I did that for six years. Well, the oration began in 1984. We have a wonderful anecdote of that mm. first oration. Um, we invited a very leading, prominent uh, lawyer, uh, Justice Michael Kirby, to be our first orator, and he happily agreed to come. He lives in Sydney. Uh, the oration was in Melbourne. And he agreed to come down, and he would fly down to Melbourne, and he'd fly back early Monday morning to Sydney uh, for his court case. He had a court case to deal with at 10 o'clock in the morning. The problem was that that weekend the airline pilots called a sudden strike and he said I can get down to Melbourne but I can't take on the oration unless you can get me back to Sydney in time for my court case and that was a serious problem but I had a wonderful vice chairman at the time and he used his initiative he chartered a light aircraft and we flew our orator at midnight after the oration in a something like a tiger moth I have this vivid mental image of Justice Kirby looking with clenched teeth, very worried as he got into this small plane. But anyway, the plane took off and it successfully landed at three o'clock in the morning in Sydney and he came to his court case in time. And that saved our very first oration. It's one of my favourite stories.